Hi. I want to thank the, uh, the organization for this wonderful event. I want to thank the jury for their time and their corruptibility. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm very sorry we couldn't arrive at a number, Jonathan, but next year. Marta, you, you look gorgeous, beautiful. All right. So um, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some, some very dry biology. And hopefully you'll see how uh, a lot of it is wrong. And we're going to try to do, um, well, what, what Occam would have liked, I, I, I want to think, which is take a series of entities that have multiplied uh, beyond control and reduce them with a simple, elegant theory in a new paradigm of uh, molecular biology. So this is the central dogma of molecular biology. The reason it's called a dogma is because it was proposed where there was very little evidence for it. And that may or may not have changed, as we'll see. So the model is about 50 years old, and it's, 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 it's pretty useful, but you know it's, it's grown a lot, and it's time for a shave. So DNA produces RNA, which produces protein. That's the basic sequence, all right? So the information, let's say, is, is, is in the DNA. The RNA copies the information and leaves the nucleus and takes the information to the rest of the cell, the cytoplasm, to make the proteins, and then the proteins actually do things. Some people today would have you believe the RNA does things. We'll come back to that in a second. But it's a, initially a very simple, very elegant model, not really in need of trimming. It had uh, um, two different kinds of cells, the bacterial cell, prokaryote here, and our cells, the eukaryotic cells, which have a nucleus. And there are already some important differences. The model's already getting complicated. So in the bacteria, you just basically copy out your DNA into RNA, and at the same time, that's made into protein, a lot of different proteins from the same thing. It's what the, uh, the big word there, polycystronic, means. And this is going to be very important for the rest of our talk. It's basically just doing one thing that is then making everything else in the same space. And then we get to this complicated entity, that, uh, that makes us. And now we have apparently, apparently monocystronic RNA, which means that there's a message, a separate message for each protein, while here just one message is being copied from this circular chromosome. So this linear chromosome, of which we have a bunch, are making separate little messages for the cell to make all the different proteins. And this is what they would have you believe. And the proteins are are actually made by the ribosome. We'll come back to the ribosome later. And in 1953, in 1965, maybe this was plausible. It, it all looks not as elegant as, as this, for sure, but still fits into a nice textbook page. Now, this is a more current picture. It's becoming very rococo. Now we have all these entities that don't actually code for proteins. We don't know what they do. The idea that we were just translating or transcribing, or translating, sorry, the, the information required to make proteins turned out not to be true because we have basically good evidence that most of the human genome is transcribed. And as you've probably read all over the press, most of the human genome and most of the eukaryotic genomes in general are, are, is garbage. So why? And then to part to explain why, uh, people start making up these different entities, these different forms of RNA that now do all sorts of different things other than make proteins. And this, if you've paid attention to Mark's talk in the beginning, is very clearly a case of this, right? We've, we don't know what to do with this new information, so we've started introducing epicycles into our initially very elegant model. We started out with a very simple thing. DNA had the instructions, it made the RNA, the RNA made the protein. Now we have all this RNA that doesn't make for protein, we don't know what to do with it, so we start creating all sorts of different entities, long non-coding RNAs, short non-coding RNAs, medium non-coding RNAs, and they do all sorts of magic things. And this is, of course, the mark of bad science when magic creeps into the data. So what can we do? How can we get rid of the Copernican, how can we introduce a Copernican model into this Ptolemaic mess? And that is where Occam's transcript comes in. We'll go back to a polycystronic um, RNA model the idea is quite simple. This is all junk. It's basically breakdown products because RNA, we know, is very unstable, very hard to handle. So when you start purifying large bits from cells like eukaryotic cells, 
what will happen, as opposed to a bacterial cell, is that you'll get a lot of pieces, very tiny pieces. And because we can't really keep the RNA together as one long piece, like we could sometimes in a bacteria, we'll start attributing reality to these artifacts of purification. Basically, you pop open a cell, the RNA all breaks, and we think the pieces were in the cell, when in fact it was just one large strand, like we saw with the polycystronic bacterial RNA. Now, this allows us to solve a series of problems with one simple thing, a big, giant Occam's shave. Small problems, like the origin of the cell, the origin of multicellular organisms, the origin of life, and a few other questions at the level. So one particular one is the origin of linear chromosomes, which are clearly circular chromosomes that have popped open, right? So now what we have are all these separate little pieces of RNA, which are actually the remnant of the giant circle being opened. Once the circle gets too big, the chromosomes start proliferating so that we have 46 of them in a cell, but still having the whole genome transcribed because it's still behaving like its ancestor, the polycystronic circular bacterial DNA. So that's the origin of chromosomes in eukaryotes. Um, we can see how it might have happened in a cell level. So this is bacteria actually are not as you think of them, they normally live colonial lives in strings. And we know that these strings can get quite big. And we also know that some cells can get quite big. A preferred model, since uh, we are respecting neuroscience, Zach, is the squid giant axon. This is a giant squid. In the giant squid, there's a squid giant axon. And a squid giant axon is a cell that can grow to a meter long. And what it's trying to do, this model would propose, is keep the whole stretched out linear chromosome intact. Okay, does that make sense? because the circle was, a, was okay. It was small, compact, but as the genome grew, before we had more complex evolved regulatory mechanisms, the easiest thing to do was just to keep the big giant thing stretched with made one big giant transcript, which generates all these little pieces of RNA that we see and don't know what to do with because they're just degradation products. Make sense? Too fast? Okay. So. That solves another old problem. When the model, the central dogma model, came up with Watson and Crick, Watson's professor, the guy who, who brought him into the game, Max Delbrook, actually sent him a letter, actually a series of letters, saying the model is bollocks because the energy will really never work. The energy needed to keep winding and unwinding these chromosomes is, is not compatible with the chemical stability of DNA. It will just crack into giant pieces every time you try to do this. And he was absolutely right. And the solution is, of course, you've probably seen it, it's, it's pretty obvious, in this model, because initially it's one giant stretched strand, which never has to fold or unfold. It's just there in the giant axon-like cell. We'll come back to the axon in a second. And as the cell gets more complex, and chromosomes multiply, and they do have to condense and uncondense to make your sperm cells and your egg cells and to start everything over from one cell or another. Obviously, it comes to the junk DNA. What you call junk DNA is the buffer DNA to allow for the cracking and uncracking of the chromosomes as the, as the giant stretched molecule that produces one giant RNA molecule does this, like a sanfona in Festa de São João. No? That's what it's doing all the time. Pretty simple, no? That's the second giant mystery of biology solved. There's, a, there's an Occam's transcript theory of aging, which is also very, very simple. The bacterial chromosome is not all the same. It has an origin of replication. When that origin, when you linearize a circular chromosome at the origin, what you end up is with the origin broken into two pieces, which we now call telomeres. And telomeres are sold to you in the media as something that is there capping the chromosome. Actually, the telomere is the promoter for the whole chromosome transcript. It drives the generation of this giant RNA molecule that goes from one end of the chromosome to the other. And as cells divide, telomeres erode. So what we know is as you age, cells with smaller and smaller telomeres will be able to make lesser and lesser efficient whole RNA molecules out of a chromosome. Makes sense? So therapeutic implications, entrepreneurship. And it solves a series of other problems because we know that the origin of life is associated to hydrothermal vents as much as we know anything about the origin of life. And what we postulate is that these giant neuronal-like cells don't have a, first, they don't have a surface-to-volume problem, which is what happens when a cell starts growing 
it has no, not enough surface to import the nutrients it needs. So what you do is you stretch out this giant transcript-making cell into a neuronal-like cell about the size of a squid giant axon. And it grows around a hydrothermal vent, which produces energy and nutrients to keep it all going. Right? This is, I'm sorry this is so obvious. Now, before we come to the last slide, this is a very testable part of the model. So what we predict is we will find giant neural nets next to hydrothermal vents. And I'd like to take this as a crowdsourcing opportunity. If you want to fund the project, we, I can see a skeptical guy thinking, but you would have seen this by now. Well, I think what will happen is if you think of what a, a net of neurons will look like floating in seawater, it looks a lot like a jellyfish, wouldn't it? So what we're really looking for is jellyfish-like creatures around hydrothermal vents, from which we hope we can take giant RNA transcripts and we can get rid of all these entities that are just employing scientists and wasting your taxes. They, they really don't do anything, all these RNAs. It's just one giant degradation garbage problem. Now, like any good theory, this poses very important questions that I cannot solve right now. There were clear ideas in the, uh, the previous uh, model about how a cell differentiates. I really don't know how that works at, that, at this point because, of course, each cell is producing a giant transcript, which is the same per cell. But we know the genes are different per cell, the gene, the, the gene products are different per cell, which probably means that different parts of the transcript are protected in different cell types, which means to me that every decision important in the cell, and this is the part where I have no evidence, I think before we can, you know, Thomas Kuhn, we, before we were in normal science, I think you're all sold on the giant transcript and it's kind of boring. But now we're in revolutionary science, which is the intelligent ribosome hypothesis. So what this requires is that the, the ribosome, which is this beautiful crystal structure, is now able to sort from these giant transcripts that are in all the different cells the things it needs to make a neuron or a stomach cell or whatever else you would like, a lymphocyte. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know how this works. I'm just excited that we got to a frontier, that we moved from, uh, from this sort of normal blah blah of purifying RNA molecules from the cell. And, and that is Occam's transcript model. It's one large parsimonious transcript that explains a lot of data, including a lot of other data that I didn't go into with discrepancies between RNA and protein levels, which I think we can now wrap up and we can refocus on this beautiful structure which is clearly determining cell fate everywhere. Um, I think not just myself, but a lot of the people who presented uh, were inspired by the logic of Vitor Gaspar. Um, so Vitor and I are now working on a, on a new cell biology model where we propose that if we take cells out of the incubator, or as he calls them, their comfort zone, and, and deprive them of nutrients, after an initial slump, they'll start growing. And, and we are... We're currently testing that model, so hopefully next year, if there's a symposium, Vito can come with me. He's actually a really fun guy. Um, everyone who's in science was inspired by Wile E. Coyote at some point. We are the people who are not smart enough to know that he was actually an engineer. And this is the man, really, Huang Suk, who you must know, who has done so much for science and Photoshop that I thought we should, uh, we should have him here today at this symposium. We should have presented some of his data. And thank you very much for your time. I have a question about timing. So I just wondered, the, the longer it gets, the longer it takes to go from one end to the other. Yes. So we were all told, as I mean, they tell us these things, dogma, <laughs> they, we were all, all, all told that everything is a bit leaky, right? It's not, you know, nothing is so great. I was just wondering how genes choose which end of the chromosome they're on. So you see that the gene that's at the starting point has a good chance of making it into protein. That is, that is an excellent question, and, and it, it, it has a very clear answer, which I think you, you've, you've missed, which is we are diploid. So actually, it's a 50-50 chance. Half of the genes start at the wrong end. But the other half that starts at the right end makes what the cell needs to survive. 
wrong. What's wrong? Uh, the wrong. Uh, the, uh, they're making an, a law. They make a negative transcript. They're making an anti sense transcript. Ah. A big giant one. And the about 25% of the cells who don't make it will just die. I mean, we, we do know apoptosis is a real thing. I thought you'd do better. <laughs> So, I think you should not be aggressive towards the only jury member that you were not able to bribe, <laughs> please. But uh, uh, I, I wonder how do you explain how do you explain the differences in numbers of transcripts? Well, that that's what I was telling you. I mean, everything. That I explained is the part I could not explain with this model, you, you know, with the ribosome. But what I think is, what I, what I speculate... <laughs> what, I, what I speculate on is what you call transcription factors, these DNA-binding proteins that you think describe uh, direct different transcripts, are actually the export carriers of different things from the nucleus out, protecting them from degradation. So in a cell, you'll get random pieces of RNA, but the part of the, of the gene you need to make a protein, the transcription factor is actually helping shuttle it out of the nucleus. And if you think of the way experiments are done, it makes sense because we're usually making mutations wondering, what if the transcription factor protein can't get into the nucleus? There are very few asking, what if it can't get out? I was just wondering on the intelligent ribosome hypothesis, which is, I think, clearly the most powerful element. <laughs> Take your time. Yeah. So I, I, I wondered if you would care to share with the audience that little anecdote that Bill Martin told us when he was going over his theory of, for the origin of life on thermal vents and he was explaining it to a bunch of uh, representatives of the church. So this is a story about, so this, is, this part is real, they, uh, about a, a very prominent scientist in, in, in Germany who's actually from Texas and, and um, the, the Catholic Church has an academy of sciences as you, as you probably know. They're very up to date, about 20 years ago they, uh, they acquitted Galileo. Um, so. <laughs> Things do take uh, a little bit of time, but it, it is better than, for example, being condemned in Texas. And so what Bill, what Bill did was he accepted an invitation to go speak to the, um, to, to the Catholic Church because his field is the origin of life. And of course, this is one of those things where, where, where everyone is interested in, in, in the theologians and, and the scientists and so on. And there's nothing wrong with, with talking to people sometimes. And so off Bill goes, Bill's about six foot two, very booming voice, and he presents his model, which has the thermal vents and the cells and the, the kind of uh, molecules interacting and polymerizing and depolymerizing and life arising and so on. And, and the bishops uh, watch this and they watch it with a great interest. And the problem with origin of life models is when you arrive at the singularity, so at the first thing that was alive, it's a unique event. So you can do experiments about everything else, the biochemistry, the cooking of it, but once you get to the singularity, you're making a historical inference for which you have no data. You have to speculate what's plausible, what's not plausible. And so at that point, Bill's speculation is, is as good as anybody else's. And, and the bishop, who was uh, no dummy, notices this and, and he says, Herr Professor Dr. Martin, at this point in your model, could you not use a little God? And, <laughs> And, and Bill didn't miss a beat. He looked at him and he said, you're right. And the more God I use, the easier it gets. <laughs> well, as a neuroscientist, as always happens in molecular biology talks, I don't have a really intelligent question to say about the actual content of your talk. As usual, I'm a bit mystified. I made it with my brain. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you can... I, I, just, I just want to comment that I'm glad to hear a molecular biology talk that finally 
uh, put the, the lie to this security and confidence that molecular biologists always seem to have about the dogma. I'm very glad to see you coming over to the neuroscience side where facts are all a bit squishy well, and we argue about what the questions really are. I, I so want to thank you, man. I, I want to congratulate you. Uh, You're really one of us. I really want to thank you because this kind of stuff is hard to get out. I mean, I couldn't get it in Nature. It's published in the Restraining well, Order. The Journal of Neuroscience may take it. So we could conclude with one or two questions from the audience. Or we conclude just here. I have the usual question. You know that chromosomes have different sizes. I wonder if size matters. <laughs> well, it really depends if they're bald or not. No, the, uh, <laughs> That's, that's a very interesting question. I, I mean, you would think that perhaps the most abundant transcripts come from the smaller chromosomes and that they would be grouped. And that's something we're currently testing as soon as we get funding from, from the Institute for the model. <laughs> <Forget it. laughs> but uh, I like that question because it makes a clear, uh, there's a clear prediction here because of the speed issue that we will accumulate. So we probably would have really important genes like albumin and things where you need a lot of the protein being packed into tiny chromosomes. Or else there's a mechanism here we haven't seen open to that. Very open. Yes. All right, so, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. <laughs>